Hello and welcome back to the Authentic Wednesday podcast. It is a pleasure to have you here on the podcast. As mentioned the last few episodes, we are on a podcast pause. However, I still wanted to bring you some episodes that have just really touched the hearts of many and of the listeners and just got a lot of feedback on. So this week's episode, Encore episode, is with Kelly Willard. Kelly talks about having a neurodiverse brain. I really love this conversation because we're talking about ADHD and being diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. This is very common. Um, I myself has worked with a lot of clients who did not even realize they have ADHD. And so we really go through that journey and what that looks like. And I love how she just talks about embracing the way her brain thinks differently, not seeing it like a huge problem, which I know some people do have. And just the way that she connects with herself, her brain and her appreciation of it and how that helps her. And she's not constantly being down on herself, not to say she doesn't have any struggles, but just the way that she embraces it, especially seeing it as God's creation. And so this is really a great conversation for anyone who struggles with ADHD, think they might have ADHD, know someone with ADHD, and just getting a a new perspective, shall I say. So let's go ahead and get into the conversation. I've had to cultivate a different relationship with my children's brains too, because instead of spending a lot of time grieving and longing for children that I don't have, I have refocus towards loving and accepting the children that I do have. And so the therapies that I mentioned that I've pursued for both children have been from a place of acceptance and nurturing, not to try to make them look neurotypical, not to try to force them into some mold, but to try to support them for the practical tasks of life that they that they need because I'm equipping them to be adults. Hello and welcome to the Authentic Wednesday podcast. Each week, my guests and I share our vulnerable behind the scenes stories of giving ourselves permission to take off our masks, let go of our expectations and embrace our own path of freedom and authentic connection. I'm your host, Bianca Hughes, a lover of authenticity and a licensed professional counselor in Georgia. Hello and welcome back to episode 30 of the Authentic Wednesday podcast. Thank you for listening. If this is your first time, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I hope you enjoy this episode. I have a guest on the podcast today and her name is Kelly Willard. Kelly is a pro neurodiversity professional with 10 years experience counseling individuals and couples in North Atlanta. She's a married mother of two children with colorful brains and has a colorful brain herself. Her favorite quote is by Helen Keller, one cannot consent to creep when one feels an impulse to soar. Her passions are music, therapy, and getting cozy with a pet bearded dragon. I had a great conversation with Kelly talking about loving all the brains, everything ADHD and neurodiversity and her experience. So let's go ahead and get into the conversation. So welcome, Kelly, to the Authentic Wednesday podcast. I am so excited to have you here and just hear all the wonderful things you have to say about your authenticity journey. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. So the first question I ask everybody, what does authenticity mean for you? Well, I've really thought about this question. And so I think that authenticity for me is living life in alignment with how God created my brain and body and working with that instead of against it. And so not wasting time thinking about the brains or body that I don't have, but working with what I do have and how to be balanced and aligned within that. Wow. I love that alignment. I love that. I feel like that's my word. Um, One of my favorite words, like whenever I'm unsure, um, it's like, wait, am I aligned? Is this, I love that, but Mm -hmm. aligned with what God has, how God's made you in your brain. Yes. And that way you're no longer fighting 
against yourself or it's a little like trying, I have brown eyes. It's a little like trying to make my eyes blue when that's never going to happen unless I buy different tinted lenses and whatnot. I would have to really try to do that. And I guess you could do that, but that would not ever truly be authentic to how you were created. And so it might be fun to dress up like that or to put that on at times, but to live in a continual state of masking of something that you're not and never was meant to be, I think is very counterproductive. Mm, I love that. So tell me, were you always authentic or is this something you're discovering and kind of like working through? What does that look like for you? Well, it's both and I think because okay. <laughs> I, I laugh, I have a pretty big personality. And so just listening to family stories and whatnot about how I was as a kid and going back into my memories and whatnot, I've pretty much always been this way <laughs> and had various degrees of acceptance for myself within that based on life circumstances, environments, peer interactions, and things like that. But at this point, at 37, I don't know how to not be this way. (laughs) (laughs) It's just asking myself, I don't really like the, the word balanced. I think balanced is a little bit of a myth. I'm not sure we can ever be in total harmony or balance. But I like the term alignment because that is, I can see it almost as a linear progression of, is this a value Uh, consistent with my behavior and thoughts and how I am portraying myself in the world, I can sort of see a a tracing of a line through those dots. And if all those dots are connected, that's a better way for me to think of my self-concept than this elusive balance component. Because living with an ADD brain, balance is quite elusive. Mm. Balance is not necessarily a worthwhile goal for me personally. And so I think of it more in terms of Am I consistent in my behaviors? Are my behaviors in line with my values, et cetera, and my beliefs? And am I living with a mask or not? Ooh, I love that. You know, that's one of our favorite words here, taking off the mask. Have you, when you ask yourself that question, am I living with a mask or not? Do you ever, let's go to the living with a mask. Do you ever say, yes, I am. And if you have, what does that look like? Or what has that looked like? Well, currently at 37 and a therapist and a mom and a wife and a friend and a sister and an aunt and all those things, I I really would like to have the appearance that I have it all together. <laughs> <laughs> and so that if I'm going to wear a mask at all, it would not be it would not be of a non ADD person. It would be of just someone who has it all together, whether or not that person has ADD is secondary. So I, I just really want to, to be portrayed to my clients and to other people that, well, I'm someone that you can come to because I have something to offer and I, I can give you compassion because I'm coming from a place of fullness in the Lord and all these things. But um, if I'm really tired I know that that mask is not serving me well, is that, that I need to get real and say this tiredness in my body and in my brain is telling me something that I'm not working with my strengths. I'm actually um, just maybe overcompensating or something, and I'm not using my skill set in a right way. I'm just spending a lot of energy trying to be all things to all people, or I'm just trying to just kind of manage instead of just breathe and and live. Mm, I love that. I'm curious. I'm always curious. What is, what do you get or what do you enjoy about, or maybe you don't enjoy it, but um, about having it all together? Because that is a theme that is definitely something I can relate to. Um, And so I always feel like if I can understand why it's important, why I'm doing for that in the moment, it helps me to be more compassionate and understanding versus, oh, you don't have to have it all together and you just can't do this, but trying to understand it. So then maybe I should rephrase my question again. So have you ever done that? Stopped and asked yourself, why am I trying to look like or present myself as having it all together? Or what do I get from that? Oh, I know exactly why I do it. (laughs) 
Okay. Be- <laughs> because I, my temperament and my, some of my earliest memories from childhood on have been of anxiety and depressive episodes and whatnot. So my, my natural temperament is one of a, a, a little bit of internal chaos. And so for me, wearing the mask of having it all together is just something that I desperately have craved from a young age that I, I just don't want to be exposed experiencing anxiety. I want to be joyful and carefree. But again, that is counterproductive because maybe my brain was not, of course, I'm meant to experience freedom and joy and all these things, but maybe my brain is just a little bit more prone to these episodes. And so instead of sort of white knuckling it and barreling through with just some toxic positivity and wearing all these masks and getting it all together and barreling through the anxiety, which does not work, by the way, I think it it serves me better to sort of accept that I will go through the ebbs and flow of these periods of time. And as long as I'm coping as well as I possibly can and not isolating and reaching out to my supports and using all the things like healthy foods and the medications and things that aren't part of my life to help me, then I'm going to emerge with joy. I'm going to come through this without the need for a mask because who I am is okay. Mm. And so I have just always tried to go to that place of control of the anxiety which then backfires. So uh, that's what keeps me seeking that mask is control. But what keeps me uh, joyful is, is over and over again, learning the lesson of releasing that control. Mm, I love that. Um, Man, you said so much good stuff. Um, Going back to that, which I deal with a a lot, and I'm sure you probably see this as your therapist, um, especially with the perfectionism is that avoidance avoidance of that anxiety or avoidance of the depression because it it is uncomfortable it is um crippling and i know for me it it can at times adjust how i view myself um you know kind of like broken or just yeah. just just can't just can't get it together. Yes. And what's can you wrong relate? with you? Yeah. How, how dare you? Your brain is broken. Your body is broken. You are a broken. Yeah. How dare you as a therapist not practice what you preach when you know that you are practicing what you're preaching, but there are going to be times where that's going to be harder because of your uh, natural uh, brain tendencies and whatnot. I, I speak as someone who lives with limbic system ADD, which is very closely related to depression and anxiety because that all originates from the limbic system. There are seven subtypes of ADD. So it is not all this stereotype of just a little child bouncing off the walls. Hyperactivity is not really a component of of my brain. So I am very familiar with, with overwhelm and a brain that has racing thoughts and a brain that tries to tell me at times, um, you're not good enough and whatnot. So I have learned to work with that instead of against it, not making my brain the enemy, but to be able to say, um, okay, brain, I love myself or I'm trying to love myself and my brain is a part of me. So how am I going to change my relationship with you here? At times, you can take me down this road of spiraling thoughts and negativity, but let me shake your hand for a minute and talk truth. The truth is that even though I have a tendency to go that way, it doesn't have to be my everyday reality. These episodes come and go. The truth is that I was created with a powerful purpose, that I have all these strengths, that ADD hyperfocus is actually a little bit of a superpower of mine, which is a great thing um, that can kind of, I can remind myself of everything that is challenging about my brain. There's also some really cool things about it. Um, And so I can tell myself the truth that there is value and worth to me instead of brokenness because God says so. And I can trust that and believe that and move forward instead of continuing to spiral downward. Wow, That's so powerful. Um, Gosh, every time I talk to people, I'm like, I learn something, I take away something, and then I learn something about the person too. But uh, I love that, man, I was just like, what? Wait, have a relationship with my brain and actually taking the time to have a conversation with my brain. That is 
powerful. Well, your brain is a part of you. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to forget that when we have a diagnosis, be it anxiety, be it depression, be it autism, be it ADHD, be it OCD, all of these diagnosis are tech are, are seen as negative. And I never want to negate the disabling aspects of these brain types. I never want to say that there's not challenge and significant life threatening challenge at times from these brain neurotypes or tendencies and uh, spectrum. But at the same time, there is also a unique way to experience God through these uh, times. And through these uh, neurotypes, I, I, I just I'm I have learned to experience gratitude through this developing of a new relationship with my brain. Because if I truly seek to love myself as God's creation, it it almost becomes a form of worship. Not uh, not to get too hyper spiritual here, but to to nurture my body is to say thanks God for creating me. I'm going to take care of your creation. And so that all goes back to this developing a relationship bit of this. The brain is not some foreign disconnected part of me that's diseased and the rest of me is okay. I don't need to get into a battle mode with my brain. Uh, it's not cancer. It's not really fighting cancer. It's, um, it's integrating your brain processes with who you are. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's my choice. Some, some people do choose not to form an identity around their diagnosis. And that is fine. That is a personal decision. And for some certain conditions like perhaps OCD or an eating disorder, it actually is very helpful to externalize those uh, intrusive thoughts and compulsivities from who you are. And th that is, that is okay. And that's part of the accepted protocols for treatment and whatnot. But I do wonder if starting from a place of profound radical acceptance of your brain could not lead to just some profound um, insights and self care opportunities for a person who has a diagnosis. And that is what I've tried to do with myself. And I've just, I'm much happier. <laughs> I'm wow. much happier. I mean, yeah, I love that radical acceptance. I think for each person, like you said, it is different. I know for some people, and it's totally okay, it's probably my choice as well not to be like my anxiety or my depression because sometimes for some people they grab a hold of that and are not able to let go. And yes. so it really depends, like you said, on the person. But I love your way of looking at it because it gives people another option and it's the power of we all know we're wired to connect or should I say we're wired to connect and we thrive in relationship and having relationships with different parts of ourselves like you know our body like someone questioned to me the other day about I think my therapist said was what was the relationship you'd like to have with your with uh, money and I'm like what 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 <laughs> What is that? What do you mean? And so I like now how you're bringing the concept in with brain. And so because we are talking about brain and you are love all the brains, I know you have a fascinating ex story regarding your brain um, and your diagnosis. Um, and I think it's very important because like you said, you're 37 and you just recently found out you have ADD. And I am finding <laughs> that's common, especially amongst women, to find out later in long, long in life as adults if you have ADD or ADHD. So can you tell us about your discovery and your experience, what that was like for you? Yes, this diagnosis is new to me, although I have always suspected that this was the case. I had just not pursued a formalized process for labeling. And that is another personal issue that everyone will decide for themselves, whether or not to pursue diagnosis or not. A lot of that has to do with the level of challenge and support needs that they have and the, just the practicality of it. In school, for example, uh, is where most people are diagnosed these days in 2020. The school system will notice challenges or the parents will notice challenges and then request an evaluation. For me, with ADD was not sort of caught in school. I was, I don't like functioning labels. So I, I hate, I, I use this very cautiously. I was quote unquote high functioning in school in that school was my happy place. And so I hyper-focused, I was able to uh, just excel at school actually, because I was 
placed after some behavior problems in kindergarten, sort of a little bit of the bouncing off the walls, but mostly just emotional dysregulation in kindergarten. And even prior to that as a toddler, things that would be diagnosed now as sensory integration disorder or sensory processing disorder, difficulty sleeping, eating with textures, with tastes, with smells, things that were not recognizable as a labeled thing in 1982, basically. And so uh, once I started having those issues at school, I was tested for the gifted program because they thought, thank, thank goodness they thought this because I could have very just very easily been just labeled as a disruption and ignored and not attended to. But there were enough people in my life supporting me and teachers and my mother that tested me for the gifted program was put in gifted and then found just an outlet for all of that mental energy. Um, It was more so mental energy and anxiety than uh, physical energy at that point. And so finding that tribe of like-minded kiddos and doing interesting, challenging things once a week only, unfortunately, in Orlando, Florida school system, gifted was once a week. That was my happy, happy place. (laughs) And then I found the drama programs and musical theater. And and I just had this opportunity to thrive where if I was uh, quote unquote out of balance one day and I had a lot of anxiety or a lot of energy that needed someplace positive to go, I was able to have that. And that became my escape and my outlet. And uh, fast forward later in life to where I was starting to experience some distress and disorganization and emotional dysregulation and a spike in anxiety and all these things, it really was postpartum for me. After the birth of my first child, I I had gotten through college, gotten through grad school, you know, had episodes of, of extreme anxiety and whatnot, but I always sort of attributed those to my anxiety disorder, which is generalized anxiety. And I never really saw it as an executive functioning issue because I didn't have children then to really max me out and wear me thin and really reveal just how difficult it was for me to go from A to B to C. Uh, My brain wanted to go to A to C to G and then back to A and whatnot. And with children, especially two children with special needs, I was just spread so thin that the normal ways I didn't even realize I was compensating. Just I I didn't have that margin anymore. And so I experienced, when I experienced postpartum depression and anxiety, I also realized there has always been something different. This is coming to a height now. Let me pursue diagnosis. And when I started reading about the dysregulation effect of ADD and the executive functioning issues, I just had a breakthrough moment that this has been me and it has been missed my whole life. Man, that's so powerful and interesting. Could you share some of the things that you read just in case we have some listeners who's like, mm, maybe that's me. Some of the things that you read about the executive functioning and the dysregulations, like just one or one or two of the things that you're like, oh, I think that's me. Yes. Well, so much of this came from reading up on autism and sensory integration disorder and sensory processing disorder, because my uh, oldest child is autistic. And so just learning about him, there was a while that I thought I was autistic without the social deficits, which is not really a thing. (laughs) And And so when I realized that so much of what, um, my son and I are very similar with just our sensitivity to noises and sounds and things. So much of that goes in the line of that sensory processing, which goes hand in hand many times with ADD um, that I, I just, there's so much overlap is what I'm trying to say. So if you're reading about neurodiversity and neurodivergent conditions, you're not going to, Uh, it's not going to hurt you if you just read up on the wrong things. So anything you read about any level of brain difference, you're probably going to see a little bit of yourself in, in it. And you're going to be able to say, okay, well, I'm not exactly, I don't think I'm more autistic. I think I might be more this and that and the other. So I found so much wonderful information in the book, Neurotribes, which is autistic specifically that helped me for my son. And it also helped me to think, okay, well, these are the way, these are the things that I need to look into more for me, the sensory aspect of this, the uh, attention aspects of this. There's just so much overlap with these unique things. And then understood.org is also a wonderful source for uh, especially children in the school system for IEP and 504 and breaking down the specific challenges for executive functioning, but more child specific an adult looking back would say, oh, 
yes, of course, this was me in elementary school. And this is why. So it's a little bit of a retrospective for some of those. Okay. And can you just, um, just for the listeners, define that neurodivergent? Yes. Neurodivergent is the term that I prefer to refer to myself as, as well as my children, where this is referring to uh, a brain that differs from the typical brain that this person is not going to experience capital letter issues such as capital letter anxiety versus lowercase anxiety that everyone experiences. Everyone experiences lowercase d depression, for example. But a neurodivergent brain is going to experience capital letter d depression, where they're going to experience symptoms in line with what is mentioned in the DSM-5, our diagnostic manual, um, which is not all encompassing. It's just the best that we have. I don't necessarily like the terminology used. I, I absolutely despise the term disorder for example. Um, But someone who is neurodivergent is going to experience a level of challenge that differs from the average person. And they're also, I would argue, going to experience the potential for greater life experiences than the average person based on the the way that they take in information um, and whatnot. I don't want to discount the disabling aspects that some will experience and actually many experience. But I will say that within every person, disabled or not, there is the capacity for joy and support and a beautiful life experience. We okay. need to we need to wake up to that fact here. Okay. Thank you. So you you're reading all these books, you're reading all this stuff mm-hmm. to help your kids. You yes, lots not- of therapies for <laughs> them and my full time job at the beginning and- was to help them. And you're not functioning as you know that perhaps you would. And then you, and then what do you do next with that when you realize, how do you discover that you have ADHD? Well, so I, I started to see myself so strongly in my children. And so I want to respect their autonomy. I won't go into too many details about their experience, but I was starting to just wake up. They're seven and five, just wake up to wow, the way that my children experience life is so similar to the struggles that I remember having. Some of my earliest memories were of distress and whatnot, just emotional ups and downs. And so I just started thinking, wow, what is, is this me? Am I really just not over identifying with them? I mean, is, and this, these things are genetic, obviously I've read and I know this to be true. And so what is this the missing piece where I have always felt so different and the standard treatments for anxiety and depression that I've gone through often on my entire life, just never truly clicked. I mean, I I was functioning well enough, but at some point they just sort of fell apart and I knew I needed to do something different. And so I, I decided to pursue a brain scan process at the Amen clinics where I received two different SPECT brain scans, one while at rest, actually I fell asleep in the scanner and one when I had completed a uh, concentration task. And wouldn't you know it, my brain lit up like a Christmas tree on these scans for both times. So meaning that my brain experiences a level of um, activation, for lack of a better word, even when I'm asleep. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Which, Which resonated with me because I'm always emotionally exhausted. And, um, and so because that my limbic system is just so, um, lit up, you know, that, that means that my, my brain has a tendency to have these racing thoughts more. And when that's working well for me, I am amazingly productive. (laughs) I have a lot of energy. I, um, I've written choral music, you know, in, in a day because that's what I wanted to be interested in. And so there's just, there's just things that are good about that, but there's also things that are very challenging. Mm. And so So when, when I'm sorry, when that was pointed out to me as this is a, a, a profile consistent with limbic system ADD, the light bulb went off to me to say, wow, I really have been coping well with something quite challenging for quite some time. And th- there's a reason why you're, you're reaching a low point here in your life where you have stretched yourself so thin and 
there's there needs to be a different thing. Uh, I, I I don't take a specific medication for ADD, but I do take something now for anxiety and depression, and it has been very helpful for me in combination with other other forms of healing for myself. Wow. So wow, you're such a good therapist. Look at those oh, encouraging. Thank you. Look at encouraging words you said to yourself. You're such <laughs> a great reframer. Oh my I god. Have, I have learned to cultivate a different relationship with my diagnosis, with my brain, however you'd like to look at it. I am on a journey to integrate my identity with these concepts in because to me it serves me no good to be at odds with myself. Yeah. To fight my diagnosis to fight my negative thoughts has never been a model that's resonated with me. I don't want to be in a fight or flight mentality. My hypersensitivity of my brain to all the senses out there and just to be alert. I, I'm already activated all the time. I don't need to be more activated than I already am. So how did it feel when you realized you do have ADHD? What was that like for you? How did it feel? It was extremely validating when the psychiatrist handed me the scan, the colorful scan. That's why I refer to myself as a person of colorful brain, because the scan was just so lit up. (laughs) But I had the biggest smile on my face. And I probably perplexed her a bit because she's probably used to people coming in with a lot of stigma and a negative worldview about diagnosis or fear or a lack of information or whatever point they're coming from. Um, And so uh, to have me smiling because I was feeling incredibly validated was uh, something maybe that threw her off. But that was my first response was extreme validation that I wasn't broken. I was different and that that's why I was so tired because I was holding myself to a neurotypical standard for so long and putting so much pressure on myself to have it all together or just to function as the typical person would. Whereas healthy for me is maybe not going to look like functioning like a neurotypical person. It's going to be functioning as a healthy person with ADD, a healthy ADD person. Wow. Okay. That's good. That's a great, great thing to um, celebrate that relief Mm -hmm. and that validation. Could you tell me, Could you tell me, because I'm kind of curious and people might want to know, what was your reasoning behind not taking medication and what other practices help you? Well, so over the years, let me clarify, I have experienced levels of anxiety and depression since age four or five. I mean, this is, I, I don't remember a time in my life where I did not experience anxiety and depression. And so over the years, uh, from about uh, college age on where I could make my own decisions for myself. I had taken multiple, I'm talking about three or four or five types of antidepressants and nothing ever really helped me partly because I don't think that I had uh, cultivated enough of a healthy relationship with a psychiatrist. I, I was just going to my regular medical doctor who, and then my insurance would change with a job. And so I'd switch. And then I wasn't seeing results because I wasn't staying with it long enough to titrate the dose. And so all of that was on me really to, although back then I didn't know any better, better. I wasn't a therapist then. And so um, I I do wish that I would have stuck with it a little more because I think I would have experienced more joy more often because eventually I would have hopefully uh, landed on the type of medication that I'm taking now. Although I, I take it back, Trintelix was just released fairly recently. So when I was in college, I don't think the type of medication that does help my depression was even available. Okay. So that just goes to show how much the the practice has changed and how much we don't know yet. But for me, for my type of brain, what I was taking was either the in, incorrect dosing or I didn't like the side effects or just it, it was just not helpful at the time. And so I was seeing therapists and whatnot, and I was never to the point of suicidality or anything. I was just very, quote unquote, high functioning, very high stress individual, you would say, but uh, achieving success at work and life. And so just sort of had this inside me the whole time and um, had a wonderful faith life. And so that kind of would, would help me. It was just that my coping skills were very different after children because I was all of a sudden at home with children who back to back children that had difficulty eating, sleeping, all the things where when they were so dysregulated and, and I could not have my 
things that I would reach for before. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, my friends, I couldn't see my friends all the time. All of a sudden, um, things just sort of fell apart for me. And then I, I, was able to find uh, Trintelix, which is an antidepressant and um, a different type of anxiety medication as well. That is very, very helpful for me personally. And I have had the same psychiatrist now for years and years. And that relationship has made all the difference. The brain scan came after that. That with brain scan was only recently because I became so curious about, like I said, that missing piece that I was more stable, quote unquote, than I had ever been in my whole life. But I was still curious that there was something more. So you, but you didn't take, you're not taking medication for the ADHD, correct? Right. I am not, I am not experiencing a level of distress or challenge from it currently. I wish I could be a little bit more organized and not lose my keys and things like that. But I quite enjoy the level of hyper-focus that I have. Uh, I'm writing a book right now. I just, I I call it sort of having ADD days and whatnot, where um, if I get something in my head, I almost, I almost forget to eat (laughs) because I just, then those days I just write my book and I just kind of remind myself, okay, you can't live in ADD world forever. Come back. You need to eat. You do, you know, but if my kids are at school or something and I end up having a two hour period, it is quite helpful for me to somehow flip into that mode and really block all the other senses out and just focus um, people think of ADD as a lack of focus. That's not exactly what it is. Our just our senses are just so on fire to to notice everything at once that it's kind of a difficulty processing and prioritizing that information. So then we can look scattered, okay. um, and we kind of lose our keys a lot because our brains are very efficient. And when we walk in the door, we may forget in a moment that we always put our keys on the the latch. Maybe we just think oh, I'm thinking about, I'm hungry, I need to go to the kitchen, so I just toss my keys on the first surface I can find. And so it's not necessarily a forgetfulness, it's just sort of a priority. At at that moment, putting our keys in the right place and being hungry are kind of sort of coming at our brains at the same speed. (laughs) And so so we we just sort of, uh, one wins out, and that's usually the, the hunger or something. And then where we put our keys kind of falls back. So what, what do you do to help you? So I know you don't take medication, but you do do other mm-hmm. things. So is there anything you do mm-hmm. when you find like you may be challenged with it? I mean, I know there are a lot of ways that it's helpful, yes. <laughs> uh-huh. focus, but um, what about when you have the challenges? What do you do in those situations? What do you so do? for me, social support has always been key. Uh, going back to my story of finding the gifted the nerdy kids, those were my kids, the, the drama kids, those were my kids. And so I, I have to, as an extrovert, have that social support. And so, and to me, that can be delegating if I ask someone to help me with this task, because I know I'm going to drop the ball or something. So I have found a lot of ways to sort of, uh, I, I don't like the word manage, but it, I found a lot of ways to thrive. And so at this time in my life, medication for ADD is not a part of that. Now, if, if listeners are out there and they're not able to have, they don't have the social support, they don't, they're not thriving, they're really, truly struggling to the point of disability, then I don't want anyone to hear, well, Kelly's not taking medication, so I don't have to, or I, you know, she's anti-medication. I, that's certainly not my position. Um, contrast this with my anxiety and depression, which would not be manageable without the medication. So for me, I, I am uh, medicating one p- aspect where I need support. And then the other aspect, I'm uh, the support that I have in other areas through friends and faith and, and um, the organizational systems I have in place. Uh, you know, uh, my keys are on a little carabiner, you know, they, <laughs> they're, they're always attached to my purse. And if they're not, they, who knows where they are, you know, there, there are things that I've learned to sort of um, go through life in a thriving way. And if it comes to the point where I'm unable to do those things, and then I, I very open to pursuing with a conversation with my psychiatrist about that, but we've conversed. And at this point, I don't, I don't feel like that's something that I'd like to do. Okay. So one of the things, um, you guys can, I'll put this information in the show notes is, um, Kelly is doing really well at sharing herself and her story and her experiences, as well as, you know, tips and tricks to help people um, love their brain more or help parents or partners love all the brains, as you say, which I love. 
what um one of the things that I saw you wrote you wrote is that the correct tense Bianca anyway <laughs> one of the things love guys. your brain Bianca <laughs> <laughs> thank you one of the things I saw you commented on and you shared was um and this is about you I know you're writing a book in the process of writing a book and you said something about allowing yourself to feel overwhelmed by the task of writing your book tell me about allowing yourself to feel overwhelmed tell yes us about but it goes back to just my distaste for uh being at odds and being at war with yourself. And so it's, I don't like to be at war with the feeling of being overwhelmed. I think it's again, counterproductive. So there's a way to allow yourself to feel a negative feeling. um, And knowing that that feeling will pass, that if you sit with that feeling for a minute, change your relationship with it, again, you can see that that feeling is not going to destroy you, that it's, it's fleeting, And if you find yourself stuck in it, that's where an extrovert may reach for social support. An introvert may have a harder time with that. An introvert may reach for a journal, a pen to just get that feeling out of their tissues in a productive way instead of wrestling with that feeling and white knuckling through it through overcompensation, reaching for an alcohol or something to... uh, on alcohol sounded silly, but uh, a substance like alcohol or drugs to numb that feeling. One of the tenets of dialectical behavioral theory, uh, therapy, uh, I, I'm not trained in this, but I do use aspects of it that are very accessible to therapists. We, we use these techniques all the time is to, uh, to be accepting of, of what is what your experience is as a starting point to then sort through what you'd like to do with that feeling. Yeah. So I'm very overwhelmed right now with the process of writing a book, which is about neurodivergent identity formation. And just saying that out loud and recognizing the bigness of the task actually helps me to put it in perspective to say, yeah, Kelly, that's hard. It's hard even if you have a typical brain. So this is extra hard for you. So what do you want to do with that? Are we going to stay there today? (laughs) Or will we just do maybe one small part of that today? And maybe a tiny part of that today, or maybe today you don't need to work on it at all. Maybe wait for one of those ADD brain days that you have where you're super focused, you know? So I'm just trying to make this process natural instead of forcing myself into something. Wow. So what has it been like for you? Um, I know one, another thing I saw you said, um, it's been a blessing and a challenge of being neurodivergent. And so as well as being a blessing and a challenge and being a divergent, you share it also with the world, right? Um, which you do so beautifully. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know how to not do that at this point. That's what ah. I was joking about earlier a bit is that I, this is how I process. I'm a very external processor. I, I am aware that this is not for everyone, that maybe they're in an environment where they would experience discrimination for sharing, or maybe they are uh, going to be unsafe for sharing. But I, I happen to be, and I acknowledge this privilege, I happen to be in a space, my career is therapy that thrives on authenticity. Uh, in a professional, balanced way. I don't share everything about my life, uh, especially not with my clients. Um, The focus is on them, of course. It's their time with me. But I I feel like because I I am open, it has helped me to be accepting because I, I have the opportunity for certain people to look at me and say, what? I would never do what you're doing. But enough people along the way, especially those who are close to me, have been able to say, huh, I guess that's okay what you're doing. Actually, that's kind of good what you're doing. And then the people that say thank you for what you're doing is very reinforcing. And it it kind of nudges me in that direction to say, I think, I think you're on a good path here. There are other people like you. Maybe, maybe you cannot be a representative for them. Uh, I don't want to speak for anyone, um, but maybe by you living freely, that may encourage someone else to live freely if it's safe to do so. And that that's very, very, very peaceful feeling for me to think that I may be encouraging that in the world. 
I love that. So what is one blessing and one challenge of being new newer diversion? Oh, just one. Just one. Okay. Yeah. I'll give you two. <laughs> two of each. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with the challenges, all right? Because that's naturally where we think, especially if there are mothers listening, fathers listening, where that's basically all your reality. I have been there. We live that. We have a family where all the brains are different in some way or another. And when you are parenting as a neurodivergent person, when you're parenting neurodivergent little ones and you're neurodivergent yourself, it it almost seems impossible some days because we're all emotionally dysregulated at times in different ways. There's a lot of sensory challenges in my home. So for example, I am quite sensitive to noises sometimes. And I have a child who is one wall of sound. (laughs) Many people out there will laugh because they have one too like this or both or five like this. This, you might say, well, all kids are like that. But if you're a neurodivergent child, you may be a little extra in that capacity. Either maybe you're using echolalia and you're saying the same words over and over again, or you're doing a, a verbal stim, which is maybe making some sort of sound that is pleasant to you and feels good. Um, and uh, it's sort of over and over again. Um, or maybe you're uh, spinning, uh, your, your child is spinning. And so there's, there's just a, a visual blur along with a humming sound sound or something like that. Well, that's going to rub on me (laughs) in a way that um, is going to be perhaps different than a neurotypical brain that could more easily block it out. And so, whereas I would never tell my children, stop stimming, stimming is a term for that neurodivergent people will use either verbal or movement or whatnot. That is just, like I said, just pleasant to them. Sometimes it's to block out unpleasant sensations. A lot of times it's just a way to express joy. If you think of a child flapping their hands, an autistic child doing that, that is a, that it can be a stim. And uh, I say, let them stim just, you know, this is an expression of joy um, for them. But, but if that stim then is just maybe the same word over and over again, and I'm hypersensitive to noise that that's going to be an issue in our house. And so um, there's a challenge there when uh, if, if somebody needs something that is different than what somebody else needs on a sensory level, that is a day-to-day frequent, multiple time a day challenge in our house. Somebody needs quiet and somebody else needs loud, or somebody is craving uh, sensory touching and the other person doesn't want to be touched or uh, things like that are just very, very, very frequent. And other challenges go towards um, just sensory overload of being bombarded. I mean, I, my, I have an anxiety issue and then these sensory issues to where if I'm feeling overwhelmed, um, I just may feel just very um, emotionally dysregulated to the point of just wanting to shut down. Well, if you're a busy working mama, you, you can't just always shut down. So I've learned to be advocate for myself and ask for those timeouts. I do have a husband who I can turn to for support at times for, um, you know, it, being with the children or whatnot. Um, but that is very often not available to me. And so I will have to postpone my sensory needs um, and, and elevate theirs as the children, because I'm their mother and they're my children. Um, and that, that can be difficult because that can lead to then somewhat of a sensory meltdown of just feeling you know, like you, you kind of have a, you need a break and you end up behaving in ways you don't want to behave. So all mothers will resonate for that, but a neurodivergent mother with neurodivergent children, they're going to really resonate with that because instead of maybe once a week happening, it might be once a day that you're facing, well, how do we all regulate? How do we all, and you're all going to regulate in different ways too. You have to, (laughs) Okay. one person needs to play with slime to regulate and the other person can't even see slime because it grosses (laughs) them out. I mean, it is, it's a lot in our house. And what's two blessings? Thank you. Oh, two blessings. Okay. Well, I truly am thrilled about how my brain may allow me to experience God's world differently. And that sounds so off the wall, but because my ADD brain notices absolutely everything and I am aware of absolutely everything, I, I, truly feel like I can notice the petals of flower perhaps differently than a different than another person. And that, that just fills my heart with gladness because I am able to maybe experience God's creation in a very special way. And um, the issue is that I may experience it all at once and it'd be overwhelming. And so I just need to sort of calm and learn how to 
distinguish between the sensory experiences. And then, I mean, I don't go to a movie theater because it's too much. I don't go to a mall because it's too much, too much, too much. Um, so there are some limiting factors there, but I just, I truly, if I'm thinking about it from an attitude of gratitude, I can see the nuance differently. So that's, that's one big blessing uh, that I am thankful for. Doesn't sound off the wall to me. It sounds really beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It has taken me a long time to see that because when you're a kid and when you're a teen and when you're in college and when you're a new mother, all you want to be is normal. What, and I, I say, what is normal? We are all challenged and blessed in various ways. And so I think that's a real problem when we start holding ourselves to a neurotypical standard yeah. and, and when you're not, and that's not the standard that is necessary for you to thrive. And let's just back up for a minute for people in general, anytime you're holding yourself to an unrealistic standard, that's a problem. That's where just distress can come in, even if you don't have a diagnosis. Yeah. Do you have another blessing? Oh, I'm blessed by my kids. They've taught me a lot of patience. You know, my, They've taught me patience in a way that would I would not have ever learned elsewhere. And so I do, I've had to cultivate a different relationship with my children's brains too, because instead of spending a lot of time grieving and longing for children that I don't have, I have refocused towards loving and accepting the children that I do have. And so the therapies that I mentioned that I have pursued for both children have been from a place of acceptance and nurturing, not to try to make them look neurotypical, not to try to force them into some mold, but to try to support them for the practical tasks of life that they, that they need because I'm equipping them to be adults. And so for them, they're facing adulthood with, a, with challenges that are unique. And so then why wouldn't I pursue various options to help them with speech therapy and occupational therapy and whatnot to, to support them in this world? Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. This was so good. So I know something because we had a conversation and uh, you said something very interesting. And, I, and I, I know it's like a huge topic, but if you could just give a small snippet on the issues or not issues I hate that word the interesting experience that takes place if you are neurodivergent and around sex absolutely and so this is something I'm comfortable talking about because my specialty for the past 10 years has been Christian sex therapy and so I'm glad that we're incorporating sex into our conversation and I, I thank thank you for that so Part of what I'm doing with my practice now, I practice at Building Intimate Marriages. It's not my practice. It's Dr. Michael Seitzman's practice. I've been blessed to be there. And uh, I'm branching out now towards uh, this love all the brains aspect of that practice to do sex therapy with individuals with colorful brains. Because I do believe that the sensory experience, uh, sight, touch, taste, hearing uh, is very different or can be very different for people with a diagnosis. Either you're perhaps hypersensitive um, and experience maybe overwhelm more easily because you're just very, very attuned to everything all at once or certain things, maybe smells you're particularly uh, heightened by, They're, they activate you more. Um, and that can be good or bad. Maybe, um, maybe that could be part of the play through, through the smells, for example, that could be relaxing to you or activating to you a citrus smell, maybe, or it could be something where you're just very sensitive to just the slightest bit of body odor or, and so it can be very aversive to you. And so I just, I want to be able to talk through people, uh, people's sensory experience of sex in a way that, um, at, that understands what are accelerators for you, um, knowing that your brain is wired slightly differently. What are the things that help you to feel safe and secure and emotionally ready for sex and kind of move you forward in the sexual process? And what are the breaks for you on a sensory level? What are the things that stop the process for you, that shut you down, that take you away from your body experience because you're just so focused on making that sense stop, make that smell stop. I don't like that touch. That touch is too much, too little. 
Um, and then, of course, you have the individuals that are going to be that sensory seeking type of individual that if you're a sensory seeker married to perhaps a sensory avoider, <laughs> It's a little bit like the scenario I talked about with my children. Then you have one child that needs to be, you know, uh, scripting from uh, from their favorite TV show and saying the same words over and over again. And the other person saying, you know, screaming, saying, stop that noise. And so to just put it back into the bedroom for a minute, you have high potential for misunderstandings and hurt feelings and confusion when really it could be as simple as, well, honey, I really just don't like that smell. Do we have to have that candle going or, you know, here's a conversation about what sets the mood for me. This Mm -hmm. is the type of touch that is pleasing to me. Or maybe even it can be getting real with yourself to say, wow, some types of touch don't even register because I'm that detached from the experience or I'm just that much of a sensory seeker that I really need a strong touch in order to have it register. Wow. Just beautiful. Conversing about all that makes all the difference in the sexual experience of partners who have colorful brains, especially if one does and one doesn't. And have you discovered this for your own experience? You don't have to answer this (laughs) (laughs) in full detail, but I would assume your own experience has led you to this topic. (laughs) Yes, 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 yes. I'll I'll spare you the details. Um, But there is something very special about how um, women in general on the, on, uh, with ADD, I think experience um, sex and um, it's very female, stereotypically female to just be very easily distracted um, and to, because our brains just have more neural connections, the hemispheres are just more connected. Um, and so we can tend to jump to conclusions quite quickly in our brain, especially surrounding the atmosphere for sex, you know, to even just put yourself in the mood sometimes is it feels like a choice because we have less testosterone than our male partners. We are sort of more prone to think about the laundry that's on the floor or, you know, the dishes not being done or are the kids in their rooms? Are they going to come out and knock on the door? And so, whereas I think the testosterone for men sort of, um, takes over a little bit so that they're a little bit more freely. And of course, I'm speaking very heteronormative here, very cisgendered. I I apologize for that. But just in this example, I'm saying um, that for for men and most men, they're going to be able to uh, be less focused when sex is on the table. They're going to be more in their body in the moment than your typical female. Now, then apply then the ADD to that, the, just the tendency to notice everything all at once. You may find yourself just maybe a little bit more negative. You may be less likely to be in the mood until maybe the dishes are done. Um, or just these are just examples of that put, for some ADD women, they may find themselves more distracted more easily. And some of that is being female and some of that is just the ADD brain that just notices everything so your husband um, inviting you to sex is at the same level of, of importance in your brain as everything you're seeing, everything you're smelling, everything, you know, did you brush your teeth, you're tasting. There's just a lot of thoughts going on, um, whereas maybe a typical female may have those tendencies to distraction, but they're going to maybe their brains register, oh, there's my husband, and that kind of is first, so. Yeah, and it's a little different than for um, the genders. A little different for stereotypes. There are certainly high drive females and whatnot. But okay, wow, thank you for that. I love that. I know our listeners will be like, "Huh, this might make sense." Yeah, well, there's a there's a takeaway there. I hope that just like if your brain is different and you notice that maybe for the first time in fifth grade or third grade or maybe as an adult like me, you know, why wouldn't you maybe experience sex a little differently if you're having questions about and curiosity about your brain being different at work or at home or something, well, why wouldn't it be different in the bedroom? And so just slowing down and asking yourself that, wow, could this maybe be behind some of the challenges in communication that I'm having with my partner? Could this maybe be why I've struggled at work? Maybe instead of just being quick to label yourself a lazy do-nothing failure, maybe you can think maybe there's something that is different about me and I have been holding myself to a very high standard. When I realized after my diagnosis that I had achieved a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a certifications, and that when I realized the level at which I'm operating in the achievements that I have, not that life is all about achievement, but I just, I started to sob because I experienced a wave of compassion for myself mm-hmm. because it acknowledged just how much I had 
been able to do when um, stereotypes about these conditions would say, no, you can't do that. And I think so often we are so quick to just label ourselves as lazy, or maybe we are afraid of getting these diagnoses because then it would say that we can't accomplish things. It's just, there's so much there to think about. Just slow down. It's just how you experience the world. Thank you. That's so good. So do you have anything else? One last thing you want to share with the listeners or is that their takeaway? Well, I hope that people listening will receive encouragement today to be curious about their brain, be curious about their children's brain, be curious about their spouse's brain, and to not jump to the conclusions of negativity, not not to jump to the conclusions of words like lazy. There, there very often is communication behind dysfunction or dysregulation. I just would hope that people would take the time to consider what their experiences are communicating to them. The same argument you've had with your spouse for the last 20 years may be related to a brain issue, maybe not, but I just invite you to see everything in a different light. Well, thank you so much for that. I know you mentioned um, a couple of books and resources, which I will put in the show notes. Are there anything else that you think would be helpful for the listeners, whether they're podcasts, whether they're videos or websites or books, anything else? I would encourage you to start to listen to the voices of the populations that we're talking about. I follow actually on autistic hashtags on Instagram, follow hashtags like unmasking uh, hashtag. There are voices that need to be heard here. And you may, you may resonate with their experience. And that may lead you to consider different things about yourself or your child. These are the experts. And so I would also encourage you to cultivate a compassionate relationship with someone who may give you some answers about your brain or your children's brain. Not all professionals are good. (laughs) I would encourage you to uh, use the trial and error method for someone with a positive perspective. Um, And that's if you are even considering a label. Really, we only consider labels because of a lot of times our insurance purposes and the requirements and just, um, and really, let's get real. We just need support sometimes. And you can't really get occupational therapy without a reason for that. And so, uh, or the school system is going to not give certain resources unless you have a diagnosis and and a formalized IEP and whatnot. So I would just be real... Um, careful about cultivating relationships with what you're putting into your brain, uh, articles and whatnot from the right sources. And at some point, you're going to realize just how ableist so much is out there and to stay away from that. So thank you for that. Where can we shower you with love? Well, I'm on Instagram at love all the brains. For therapy, I'm at www.intimatemarriage.org, which is building intimate marriages. And I'm happy to put resources there and to continue filming videos and uh, updates on when this elusive book is coming out and um, uh, other things there. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you on the show, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Wasn't that great? Lots of great information. Everything neurodiversity, as I said. If you loved what you heard, please don't forget to share with your friends on social media. You can just take a picture, take a recording of what you loved and share your takeaway. Love to hear from you. You can tag us on Instagram at Authentic Wednesday Podcast. And then also you can also tag Kelly if you love what she had to share at love underscore all underscore the brains underscore the brains. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear the takeaways. Please share. And I hope you are just having an amazing day, morning, or evening. If you connected with what you just heard, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. You can stay connected by following our Instagram, Authentic Wednesday Podcast, and visiting our website, AuthenticWednesday.com. Remember, authenticity is a journey, not a destination.